partial capos was kind of a um, it was kind of a naive um, uh, invention on my part um, in playing with cul-de-sac and playing in open tunings. Um, I sort of got in the habit of having two or three guitars with me so I didn't have to change tuning on stage and I got the idea that maybe I could do like a partial capo, just capo the bottom three or four strings and still use the top strings to play the melody on the whole length of the neck. What I didn't think about when I first came up with this was that if you, I mean it's logical to anyone that knows, that has half a brain about music, is that if you capo uh, some of the strings it's basically going to change the whole uh, relationship or the scale of the notes to each other and um, that became a very fortuitous thing because I began using partial capos as a, a compositional tool and after I did my first album I wasn't too techno dweebish about uh, giving the I did give the tunings on it and that was as much as anything a kind of homage to Robbie Basho and John Fahey some of my favorite uh, guitar players who always listed the tunings on their albums and um, when I uh, listed the tunings on there, I got several emails after my last album came out from people who wanted to uh, learn how to play those songs and wanted tips on how to, you know, on what they should do and all that. And of course, with partial capos, my giving the tunings didn't really mean much because if somebody tried to tune up to those things, they'd be snapping strings all over the place. So I decided on this album that I would kind of explain what partial tunings are and and also give what uh, what. Uh, frets I'm capoed on for them. But I've been using it as a kind of a composition tool for probably about 20 years or so. And I would say probably, I don't know, 75% of the songs in cul-de-sac and more than half of the ones I've done in solo guitar utilize uh, partial capos. Um, so I don't know, I just basically get a hacksaw and cut the ends off and take it from there. Fishtown is the uh, the part of Philadelphia where um, um, where Jack Rose lives, who um, I've worked with for a long time. Jack is uh, one of the I don't know. I consider him a young player. I guess he's not that young. He's in his 30s, but he's younger than me. And when I first ran into Jack in 2003, it was out at the uh, that Free Folk Festival in uh, Western Massachusetts, which has kind of become uh, kind of an infamous festival. And um, as soon as I heard Jack, it was just uh, instant rapport. I completely understood what he was doing and where he was coming from in terms of the, uh, not, not, the not only the influence of John Fahey, who is, uh, you know, whose playing style turns up on a lot of solo acoustic guitar players, but also Robbie Basho. And when Basho died in 1986, this was before CDs were even happening, uh, most of his albums were out of print, and Robbie had barely been able to sustain a career working at it full time his whole life and I thought within 10 years nobody's going to even know who Robbie Basho is. It was just it just seemed profoundly sad to me that he was gone and that there was just such a small audience for him while he was alive but what's amazing is there's probably more of an audience for him now than there was when he was alive. It's just a kind of a shocking occurrence you know more of his stuff is in print now than was uh, when he was living and you've got young players like not only Jack Rose but James Blackshaw who you mentioned you played earlier and um, Stefan Basho Junghans who are totally coming from you know a Basho place and Blackshaw has been particularly uh, quick to name Robbie as an influence and you know saying he's his favorite guitarist and all that but anyway um, to get back to this uh, you have to you have to rein me in here it's a little too early for me to keep my thoughts uh, uh, to you know uh, I don't know something. Um, the The story comes from uh, just just the part of uh, Philadelphia that Jack Rose lives in is called Fishtown, and um, I don't know. Barbecue Bob was one of the uh, great Atlanta twelve string guitar players, so I don't know. I just had this idea of of Barbecue Bob visiting, you know, Fishtown. So uh, it sounded like a good title. So that's probably and you, about. And you actually just you, you actually just came back from being out there. And... Yeah, I went down to record uh, a couple duets with uh, Jack for. I think it's a, um, a, a set of three or four seven inches that he's planning to put out of duets with um, members of Pelt, uh, Micah Blue Small Doan, I, th I think you know who he is, and, um, and myself. And so we did uh, two songs down there, one, of, uh, one called May's Place and a new version of uh, Linden Avenue Stomp. Uh, Jack and I have been doing it so often live and, and we play it so much hotter than the recording that he wanted to get a new version of it, you know. Um, but yeah, Maze Place, if you have Jack's recent uh, all slide guitar um, 
album. Uh, it's, it's kind of a limited thing that he's just selling on tour, but there's a solo version of May's Place on there. It's one of his lap steel pieces, and uh, uh, it's great, really great. And so I went down there with the 12-string, uh, and we came up with, a, uh, I think, a pretty nice arrangement for that one. It's kind of... Uh, it's almost like a slack. It's like Gabby Pahinui or or kind of slack key guitar with uh, lap steel. You know, um, it's nice. I'm not sure when these will be out or anything, but uh -huh. sometime later this year, I think. So anyway, shall I play? This is uh, this is Barbecue Bob in Fishtown. <clears throat> ZBC, and that comes from his new album, Against Which the Sea Continually Beats, and um, he will be playing tomorrow night at uh, PA's Lounge with Jeff Mullen, Keith Fullerton Whitman, and Lloyd Thayer, and um, so uh, that's, uh, yeah, tomorrow night, PA's Lounge in Somerville, 9 o'clock, and um, yeah, what else have we got to uh, listen to today? Uh, let's see, well, I brought along uh, my other favorite guitarist from the Tacoma label, is uh, Robbie Basho, and um, it's um, it's gratifying to see so much of Robbie's stuff is be being reissued on CD. I think there's more stuff in print now than ever was before, um, but there's uh, a number of pieces that still haven't been reissued on CD, and this being uh, 33 and a third revolutions per morning, I thought I would bring a couple of uh, albums along and 
play a track from uh, Robbie's uh, Falconer's Arm album. Um, that was a, a volume one, volume two uh, release on Tacoma in 1967, same year that Fahey's uh, Days Have Gone By was issued. And this piece is called uh, Song of God, and it's a 12-string piece. And um, I don't know, sit back and listen. I, I, I think it's a, a beautiful piece. It's kind of long, and I don't know how I have the uh, chutzpah to, to insert myself in between uh, guitarists like Fahey and Basho, but this is uh, a great piece. Uh, Song of God from uh, Falconer's Arm, Volume 2. And uh, do, are, we, are we able to give away a pair of tickets? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so, yeah. you know, if uh, you know, we'll, we'll go into this song, and um, now we can take a call if uh, you want to see the show tomorrow night. We'll give away a pair of tickets. Ooh, the phone's already lighting up. <laughs> All right, so we'll go into this song by Robbie Basho. And, um, and what, what's the name of the song again? Song of God. Song of God. Okay, right here uh, from the vinyl, brought in by Mr. Glenn Jones. <laughs> CBC. Yeah. Ah, well, you just tell me your name. Okay, hold on a second. Let me just find a piece of paper to write this down on. Hold on. Hold on. Do you want to do another yeah, I'll song do, uh, a different instrument? Yeah, I've got, I brought my uh, resonated guitar for a slide piece and I actually brought a banjo. I've never uh, performed out with the banjo before and I've got like one piece that I've written on it. So I thought, well, what the heck? And I wanted to do some stuff that wasn't just uh, stuff off the record. So. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> All right, Jeffrey, what's your last name? PA's Lounge. So. P A. Yep. Yeah, it's 345 Somerville Ave. And that's in Somerville. That's Union Square. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't have their phone number, but I have but their their web their website is just paslounge.com. Yep, yeah, paslounge.com. Tomorrow night, 9 o'clock, you have a pair under your name. Yeah. It's just under all the performers' names. It's just Jeff Mullen, Glenn Jones, Keith Fullerton, Whitman, and Lloyd Thayer. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a venue. It's a, you know, it's a show. It's, there's, there's four performers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for calling. All right. Bye. Have you been to a show before? It's. Uh... <laughs> All I knew was it's free. You know. I'd be surprised if he actually shows up. <laughs> just the way. Yeah, okay. Just by the way he was talking. It's like okay. But yeah, where I, this is a show. Yeah, <laughs> sounds great. Great. Yeah. <laughs> they have beer. They serve. Uh... So we have a report that the streaming sounds okay. The uh, oh the that's right. You're on the web, right? Yeah, we're on the web and on the airwaves and. It's 33 and 3rd Revelations per morning, but... Oh, Revelations! But I never... I never even say... I never even... On my they website, just, I put Revolutions, they just, so. they just ask for a name, you know? It's just, it's just rock. I just say it's just rock part one. I don't... You know, my show's not all that special. Like, there's some people that have... Like, I had the idea that it should be LPs only, you know? Yeah, or. that'd be great, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, did I call you John earlier? It is John. I mean, did I call you Pat earlier? I don't think so. Okay. I don't know, I have, in the middle of playing David and the Phoenix, I was like, did I just call him Pat? <laughs> Bobby Basho, any relation to Stefan Basho? No, Steph, but Stefan gave himself that name after discovering Robbie's uh, music. It was okay. just uh, Stefan Junghans. Right, um, right. But he was so impressed with his music that he, you know, and he, Stefan, I think, was already into, um, like, um, the poet uh, Basho, you know, the Japanese poet. Uh huh. And so I think he was like, you know, well, there's a real connection here, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of be the poet through Robbie Basho to me, you know, and Stefan's got a lot of interesting ideas about the artist and society and uh -huh. you know he's got a lot in common with Robbie besides the name you know yeah it, it, I, I know uh, yeah the, the other uh, yeah Strange Tragedy just put out a CD from him yeah that's too. a really nice that's album really I think too and I and I gave it to somebody to write about for Brainwash and I never never got it back no, I never got a review I never I, I don't know where that CD is it was really good I heard it a couple times before it left my hands so. Yeah, he's got like, there's like three new ones that came out at the same time. There's Unknown Music 2, which I think is really good. And uh, the one on, uh, is it Locust? Uh -huh. the, uh, the wooden guitar, One Year of the Dragon or something like that, or the Dragon something, I forget what it's called, which I think is also quite good. One already picked out for the next album. It's a rabbit. Oh, it's a rabbit with a guitar. Okay, good. Rabbit with a guitar, yeah. And he's having a, he's running away with the guitar and somebody's throwing eggs at him. Yeah. Right. I think it was an Easter postcard. And guitars always have four strings and uh... Yeah, they have four strings or not enough tune or tuning pegs or Sure, right. But it's amazing how many of them I mean there's a lot of banjos and I don't know what you would call them, lutes or something like that, where they're kind of but it's like a beginning of the 20th century, all of a sudden the guitar was so popular, it was appearing in lots of, uh, you know. Uh, this is such a great piece. <clears throat> so Tacoma is still in existence, I guess. Yeah, but they had, um, they were recently, um, you know, it's all part of the fantasy. Hi, how are you doing? Do you need to goodbye? Yeah, no. Okay. Hi, Marissa. Hey. Glenn. Hey. Nice to meet I you. I this one, it's great, yeah. Thanks. Um, they're still going, um, but the um, uh, Concord Jazz, which is kind of a middle-of-the-road jazz label, bought the whole fantasy mm -hmm. uh, thing. You know, there's like I don't know it how many like labels. Stax involved with that somehow. Stax, and... Prestige, right. Bluesville, um, all the John Coltrane stuff. I mean, well, that's like just... Impulse too, right? Well, not Impulse. Not impulse, impulse is not part of that, but. Um, all the Coltrane stuff that was recorded for Prestige. Uh -huh. um, it's just a huge, huge catalog. And they bought the, bought the label, fired three quarters of the staff working for Fantasy. Um, Bill Belmont, who's the guy that's been doing the reissues of the Tacoma stuff, is still there. 
but he lost his secretary and they just got rid of everybody. And since they've taken over the label with a catalog that huge, I think they've done something like three or four releases in about 18 months. I mean, they were putting out, you know, 20, 30 releases a month when they were, you know, going. And it's basic, I don't understand why they bought it. It's just, you know, it's just, I don't know if they just see it as a, a cash cow or a way of, uh, I mean, there's, you know, Conquer Jazz is like, it's not exactly a cutting edge jazz label, you know? Um, so, I don't know, it's, it's disappointing. And I'd hope to see a few more uh, Fahey reissues, but I think the only reason that tribute album even got done was they had already started it before the purchase took place. So they finished it, but I think they've done that and maybe one or two new releases by new artists, but virtually nothing in terms of reissues. A lot of the stuff has been deleted from the catalog. I mean, it's like it seemed like it was working just great, and then it's like another case of like, you know, yeah. you know, it's, is it going into stasis now? Is somebody else going to have to buy this in 10 years and start the reissue process over again or what, you know? Yeah, that's I. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and you know the the, the thing about the thing that just irritates me about the, the music business is that is that the way that it's set up is so detrimental to artists. Like just the fact that you know if you're if you're an author and a and a publisher publishes your book, you still own the rights to your book, and once mm -hmm. that you know one you know. If you want to take it to another publisher, you can take it to another publisher. But when you record it for a label, they own the recordings, and that's it. Yeah, They're usually done. that's true. That's usually, true. You know, sometimes you can get like, uh, you know, I mean, like James Brown had the rights to his stuff. He was smart enough at a young age to have the, you know, to have something in the contract. The stuff reverted back to him. But yeah. very few artists that have the, uh, the cloud or the, uh, the, the, the foresight to do that. Right. You know. And that's Robbie Basho going back to 1967 from the uh, Tacoma label, which we were just talking about uh, during the song. That has gone through uh, shifting ownerships, and um, it's there's still there, there's still somebody at the wheel, but it's uh, not really as as uh, productive as it was back in the back in the heyday. Yeah, for a while there, um, for a while there, they were the, I mean they were just putting out quite a few releases, reissuing a lot of stuff on Tacoma. But they were recently bought out by Concord Jazz, who, uh, from what I understand anyway, gave the pink slip to about three quarters of the people that work for Fantasy. And since the uh, the purchase took place, I think something like uh, you know three or four or five releases have come out in the past 18 months, which is very disappointing. You know, very disappointing for those of us who are looking forward to, or were looking forward to more uh, Tacoma reissues as well as other stuff on the label. I mean, that's a huge catalog. All the Fantasy Prestige. Coltrane releases, all that stuff, you yeah. know. Maybe they're, I don't know, maybe they're waiting to get some kind of a, one of those digital deals where they yeah. put it all on iTunes for, you know. Could be, could yeah. be. I don't, I don't know what they're thinking. At least people can get is. the music that way, but it's still just not the same thing as having, like, no, know, artwork I and, and. I don't, and, I don't and go along with that, you know. Like it's that. A, yeah, it's a, I, I definitely came up with, you know, I mean, I probably have about 10,000 records in my collection and. The idea of not owning an actual physical thing. I mean, it was hard enough to make the transition to CDs, yeah. but yeah, I haven't been able to join the iPod revolution. Right. right. Um, part of it, uh, part of the um, the problem I have too is that it kind of, um, to my point of mind, and I may be stepping on the toes of some of your listeners, but to my to my point of view, it's it it kind of marginalizes the music in some ways, in the sense that it becomes. I don't know. It's kind of like download, just downloading the uh, the chase scene from your favorite movie or something like that. Yeah. I mean, when I think of albums, I think of them as having their own kind of autonomy and arc. And uh, to just kind of pull a song off this album and that album, I don't know. It just kind of uh, plus, you know, the whole idea of like uh, it's on your on your thing for six months and then you, you know, delete them all and and you know, I don't know. It, it's just. Uh, it feels like it cheapens the music, but that's probably just the old fogey in me speaking. I think I heard my father say similar things about, you know, Frank Sinatra versus Jimi Hendrix when I was 17 or something, so. <laughs> I, I think it, you know, it, it, it can, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 can, it can work for a, for a certain style of music and a certain lifestyle of person that, that, you know, listens to that type of music. I mean, there's people that, you know, back in the 80s or 70s or 60s would, you know, buy 7-inch singles and, you know, the hey, great, that's only 99 cents for a 7-inch single it's, and it's the, a compact version of some, whatever's on the album and, 
You know, so there's there's people that only listen to singles. There's people that only listen to top forty radio. So, and 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 those, you know, those songs get cycled through so quickly. I mean, you know, you ask anybody who listens to top forty radio what what was big on the top forty, you know, six or seven years ago, they probably they probably wouldn't know. You know, it, hmm. it, it doesn't have a lasting effect. So, I That's think I think the, I mean. the iPods and, and and that kind of downloading, you know, cherry picking songs here and there probably has the same effect, you know, for, for somebody whose lifestyle suits it. But, yeah. you know, for I hope there's, you know, I, I people don't change that much, so I know that there are definitely people out there who are, you know, digging deeper. And the same thing was true of me when I was a teenager. I mean, I can remember buying, you know, the Good Vibrations uh, 45 when it came out, and that led me to the album, and what an album, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're here with Glenn Jones. Um, he's got a new album out, and he's playing tomorrow night at PA's Lounge. We've already given the pair of tickets away, sorry. But um, you can still go to the show. It's at 9 o'clock tomorrow night, PA's Lounge. Uh, record release party for uh, Against Which the Sea Continually Beats, which is on uh, Strange Attractor's Audio House. And uh, also on the bill is Jeff Mullen, Keith Fullerton-Whitman, and Lloyd Thayer. And uh, Glenn, you've, you've, you've brought out another instrument. If you want to explain to people who cannot see what I'm seeing right now, what exactly you're holding in your hands, and... Um, you know, and, and on your finger. <laughs> This is a resonator guitar. The strings are raised up very high off the neck, and I'm playing it with an old, um, I think this is a uh, oregano spice bottle or something. I've had it for about 20 or 30 years. I've never been able to find another one quite like it, but I'm very comfortable with this one. So. But anyway, I'll play a couple of uh, I'll play a medley of two of the uh, the bottleneck pieces on my album. Um, the first one is, is called um, Island One, and the second one is called Against My Ruin, and um, uh, that's that's all I guess. <laughs> I'm at a loss of rewards, so I guess I'll play. Okay.
Um, I had played out at Martha's Vineyard a number of times at a, a, a record store called um, uh, Above Ground Records, and uh, Chris Liberato promotes a lot of shows out there. And I hadn't, as close as I lived to, as close as we here, lived to Martha's Vineyard. I hadn't been there in like over 20 years, and it's just an amazing place. I mean, um, the, sh the shows that I did out there, there would be, you know, grandfathers and grandkids at them and stuff. I mean, there's a real wide uh, range of ages and um, people coming up to me afterwards saying, oh yeah, I saw Faye in 1965 and, you know, now my, now my, my kid is into him and all this stuff. But um, the guy that had done the sound for me out there, Anthony Esposito, uh, just seemed remarkably good at getting a really good acoustic guitar sound, which... Uh, isn't as easy as it sounds, and uh, I had decided that maybe working with Anthony out on the out on Martha's Vineyard would be cool. So I just asked him if he was into it, and he invited me down. And I end up recording in his like attic apartment over the course of four or five days. And uh, you know, unlike my pal Jack Rose, who you know trumpets in his uh, liner notes that this, this is a first take and all the songs are first takes. I'm not a one take kind of guy, but I did get I think. Four of the 11 tracks on the album were first takes, and I think that was just because it was just so relaxing and so nice down there. And uh, I think Anthony did a great job on the sound. I'm really proud of the way the sound, the album sounds. There's no, almost no compression, almost no reverb. Um, all the um, things that may sound like reverb and all that are just a, a product of getting the microphones. Um, you know, just bringing up the microphones that are farther away can will give you a reverb impact and all that. So. Well, I'll finish off. Um, I, I can tell your listeners that there's absolutely no banjo on my, my new record, but I do love the banjo, and I always have. And I recently uh, found one on Craigslist for pretty cheap and had it repaired. It's a turn-of-the-century banjo. I think it's uh, Excelsior. Yeah, Excelsior banjo, probably from 1910 or 1915, something like that. Anyway, this is the first piece that I've written on the banjo. Um, I don't have a title for it yet, so... Ready? Yeah. Oh no, I do have a title for it. It's called Keep It 100 Years. Keep It 100 Years. Yeah. Okay.